Hey everyone, as you know, it is August, that is birthday season for us here at Stuff They Don't Want You To Know, so we're going to take some time, take some space this week. Oh, space, I did an accidental pun. Uh, We're going to do some classic episodes in place of our usual strange news and listener mail segments, but fear not, dear constant reader, uh, as Stephen King would say, we are going to return and we have received so much correspondence that we're actually putting a lot of research into our listener mail uh, segments at this time. Okay, this is a question that Matt, Noel, and I always get asked every time we appear on various other media platforms. The question goes something like, okay, we're off air now, guys. Do you think people made it to the moon? Well, I mean, we know Stanley Kubrick made it to the moon with his uh, his uh, cinema camera, right? I, I kid, but I always loved that theory because I'm a, you know, I think we're all big cinema buffs. Uh, the idea that old Stanley secretly filmed a, a cinematic masterpiece that had the whole world fooled. But, you know, unfortunately, that's pr- pr- pretty unlikely. It's a good story. Yeah. But how did he how did he get past the Van Allen belts, Noel? I don't know. I don't think he could. I don't think any of us could. Well, dare to dream and so on. Uh, the the idea, yeah, the our I think our mutual favorite conspiracy about moon landings, favorite conspiracy theory, is that Stanley Kubrick uh, traveled to the moon to film the moon landing uh, as as a fake, uh, and he, you know, originally was supposed to have it in a studio somewhere in California, but of course, being an auteur and a man with an eye for detail, he said the best way to fake the moon landed is yeah, is for me to fly to the moon and fake it, fake it on location. Uh, so, so in this one, we are, we are interviewing, we are interviewing a fellow Matt. His name is Matt Johnson. How many years ago was this? It was 2016. We are interviewing this filmmaker about his newest work, Operation Avalanche, notice astute listeners that none of us, not Noel, not Matt, not me, none of us gave you a conclusive answer on our opinion of whether or not human beings have landed on the moon. What do you say we find out what past Matt, Noel, and Ben thought about this? From UFOs to psychic powers and government conspiracies, history is riddled with unexplained events. You can turn back now or learn the stuff they don't want you to know. Hello, welcome back to the show. My name is Matt. My name is Noel. I'm Ben. This is Stuff They Don't Want You To Know. And as always, thank you so much for tuning in. You know, we've been doing a lot of interviews recently, guys. Yeah, we have. I'm I'm enjoying the spate. I I guess we wonder how you guys feel about it. The spate of interviews, the yeah. interview spate. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I gotta say, I've been I've been enjoying it too. Um, especially when we get to learn new things and uh, talk to interesting uh, individuals. Right. Yeah. So in previous episodes, we spoke with uh, the author Brian Tui about sports conspiracies. Today, we are interviewing a fellow named Matt Johnson, who is the director, writer, and star of a film coming out today, as if you're listening to this the day it comes out, uh, today, September 16th, as we record this episode. Yes, it's called Operation Avalanche, and it's it's very difficult for me to describe everything that this movie encompasses because it's a movie about making a movie with people using their real names, but it's complete fiction. It's incredible. Right. Uh, here, here are the facts. On July 20th, 1969, the course of human history fundamentally changed when Neil Armstrong became the first man to set foot upon the moon. And then Buzz Aldrin did it a couple minutes afterwards. Right. And once, once these people went there that one time uh, on the Apollo 11 mission, then the official story is that there were five more missions. So a total of six Apollo missions with two astronauts making contact on the surface each time for a total of 12 people on the moon. And then we stopped going to the moon, right? Yeah. Then we stopped going to the moon. So I want to ask you guys, Operation Avalanche is about 
how a moon landing could have been hoaxed. So yes. I, I want to ask you guys, and we want to ask you, audience members, to let us know, what what do you guys think? Do you guys think somebody faked the moon landing? I hope it was Stanley Kubrick. According to the latest polls that I could find on this, roughly 7% of the American voting public believes that the moon landing was hoaxed. However, that belief in a hoax moon landing is pretty popular in other countries mm-hmm. as well. So it's it's more common there. Well, we're going to just hop into our interview with Matt right now and then uh we'll come back at the end and see if our uh, see if uh, anybody's had their opinion swayed. What do you think? Yeah, I I love that idea. Uh quick note, Noel, you were not with us for this interview. It's true. But you're here with us now through the magic of time travel uh, audio, time traveling audio. We have an actual time machine here in the House Stuff Works offices that we only use in cases of emergencies like this. Because it operates on blood. And blood magic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you gotta put the magic after. <laughs> and quick caveat at the top here, there are spoilers inside of this interview, so listen with caution and go see the movie. And here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, we are here with Matt Johnson, the director, co-writer, and star of Operation Avalanche. So, Matt, we have to know, man, what led you guys, specifically uh, you and your co-writer, down this moon landing rabbit hole? Well, uh, when we first started, the plan was just to make another fake documentary about some great historical moment. Um because we had such success with our first film, The Dirties, and we really, 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 really liked that formal approach of sort of the authorial fake documentary by neophyte filmmakers. Like, that that was just so interesting. Um, and as we started looking at different moments in history to kind of do this about, it just became so obvious so quickly that the moon landing, if it was faked, is like the most incredible movie ever made. And so if you're trying to make a story about people making movies, then why not have them make the greatest movie ever seen that nobody actually knows is a movie? Um, and it's, it was it, it, almost as soon as it was mentioned, oh, let's do the fake moon landing. Like, that was it. Then we were good. Like, we just knew. And, and oddly enough, just that idea was so powerful that it, it gave us energy to just keep going and going and going and going. When when we thought, okay, this is this is ridiculous. Oh man, we can uh we can certainly relate with that drive that you get when there's some kind of mystery like that out there that it just kind of hangs there in front of you like a carrot. We we definitely understand that in our line of work. Yeah, and it's so it's so clever for it to uh for it to take that. A uh, documentary format uh, about the, you know, when you say it this way, Matt, it's it really is the greatest movie ever made if the moon landings are faked. And it's strange in the course of our research, uh, it, it's strange how this story has captivated people for nearly half a century now. And, and, and we have to ask just to get get this uh elephant or lunar rover in the room out of the way real quick uh why do you think uh some people <laughs> some people believe that the apollo 11 moon landing was faked i can tell you um i i think one of the major reasons that that conspiracy endures the way that many others are a bit more laughable and are not nearly as popular is because of its innocence and the fact that there really are Although there were some stakes to the Apollo mission and it was very important at a certain time, nowadays it almost doesn't matter if they did go to the moon or they didn't. Geopolitically, like there's no, it's not like saying I believe that 9-11 was an inside job or saying and committing to the fact that JFK was, an, was assassinated. Like those have real consequences if they're true or they're not true. Whereas the moon landing being fake is just so goofy and it's just so, it's almost, I mean, as you see in our film, like, it's just a great story if if that's true. Like, if they didn't go to the moon and they faked it, then that's a really amazing story. And it's not the, – the social cost for saying you believe it is not quite as high as saying, you know, you think George Bush had something to do with the 9-11 attacks. Like, you just, you just don't pay the same price for believing it, and it's more fun to believe. Um, now, me personally, I do not think the moon landing was faked at all. Nobody on, our, on my team does, not even a little bit. 
Um, uh, but that's actually one of the reasons why we wanted to make the movie was because we thought, how wicked would it be if we can make a movie that is convincing enough to make people think the moon landing was fake, even though that's not what we believe. Like that was just such an amazing like trick and an amazing challenge for us. Um, um, but the, the, I guess those two ideas are not really that related, but as I said, that's why I think it endures and why people believe it. Also, it comes from a very American sort of cowboy notion of I know better than my government, oh. uh, which is something that's <laughs> very, very popular right now. Absolutely. The, the government is lying to me that everything I'm being told is fake. I, I think I think that also plays into it big time. I think you're going to see more people in this coming election cycle talking about this type of mass government lying, mass government conspiracies than you ever have, it, 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 ever. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. I think that's a. I think that is a uh, fair and accurate prediction. Uh, one thing that we discussed that we really enjoyed about the film when we were watching it is the the biggest question for any um a- anybody applying critical thinking to that kind of conspiracy theory is how could thousands and thousands of people keep a secret like this if it did happen for so long and uh we Matt Frederick here maybe you can uh talk a little bit about this uh from our discussions and uh what we thought was so clever about how the film handles this. Oh, yeah, absolutely. This is the point that we've grappled with when discussing this conspiracy in particular. And, dude, when you give your CIA uh, presentation and you're explaining how you're going to make the whole thing happen and there's only a handful of people that are going to have to be involved, including the astronauts, I was just going, oh, wow, I've never had someone pose it in that way. Um, that you wouldn't have to have mission control involved. Like, <laughs> you only have to convince the astronauts to to read the script. That was our biggest challenge, was trying to figure out how to make that part of the conspiracy believable. Because nowhere where we looked online, even with people who are really into this conspiracy, had an effective answer for that. Um, and so coming up with that and figuring out how like a like a junior guy in the CIA would be able to pull something like, like that off was one of our big achievements. Like we were really, really happy with that. And I mean, although it seems in, insane, it does have a lot of credibility to it. Um, as I said, like we, we spent a lot of time at NASA and it was important to us that what Matt says, the CIA is actually true. So speaking of NASA, let's talk about the Johnson Space Center. Uh, it, it looks like you're filming inside that facility and it looks like you're interviewing people. Is that, was that really happening or is that on set? No, no, that's all real. We, we, I mean, I was a grad student in Toronto at the time and we, we contacted NASA and said that we were making a documentary for school about the 1960s and we went down from Canada and spent about a week there and we shot most of the movie that you see at NASA in actual, I mean, we, 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 we digitally turned it into the manned space, uh, space center, which it was at that time. But uh, we shot the whole thing in Galveston, all, all that stuff. And those are real NASA staff. They really have the jobs that they say that they have. Like that's all completely real. That's insane. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's fascinating. And that also, but I, this isn't even a question, but more of a lead in. I, I want to commend you on the pitch perfect visual tone. It, it is, it, it is exactly of the time, which I thought, I thought was fascinating. In some earlier interviews, you had talked a little bit about the process of that filming. But while we're on the subject of film itself, uh, we have to ask, why do you think Stanley Kubrick is so important to the context of this conspiracy? I think there's two really big reasons why Stanley Kubrick is such a big deal when it comes to conspiracies in general, but also the moon landing conspiracy. The first one is he was insanely reclusive. He was, uh, uh, people already knew him as a secret keeper, as an unbelievably secretive guy. He famously burned his 2001 sets once they finished shooting because he didn't want people to have access to them. Like he did, he had behavior that did make sense from a certain point of view, but could be twisted in such a way where you could go, okay, this guy's operating at a different level than the way people are uh, imagining that he does. And two, the auteur reputation that he had um, of pouring so much work into the things that he did 
I think allowed people to again think that he could do the impossible. Uh, like when new Stanley Kubrick movies were coming out at that time, they were always pushing the boundaries technically of what could be done um, in a way that no other filmmakers were nearly as famous for doing. So it just, I think those two elements came together very well to make him a central figure in the, in the moon landing conspiracy. I mean, and it didn't hurt that he was making 2001 at the exact same time. Yeah. And then he uh, burned the set. I mean, come on. Coincidence. <laughs> uh, exactly. Exactly. Well, OK, so just let's continue on the, the, the Kubrick line here. Let's talk about Room 237 and The Shining. We watched Room 237 at uh, TIFF. I think it was out in 2011. I'm not I'm not sure when we saw it, but uh, but we went back to that uh, a couple of times when we were writing this movie. Um just because it wasn't the first time I'd heard that theory, but it was definitely the most eloquent combination of elements um, that I'd ever seen. I, I love that film. Awesome. Did you also watch Capricorn 1? Yeah, Josh Bowles and I had seen Capricorn 1 well before that. Oh, um, awesome, awesome. But mostly because it's such a funny movie. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but yeah, yeah we, we, we also watched it. In fact, there's a lot of dialogue um, in Operation Avalanche that is just straight up lifted from Capricorn 1, if you look closely. like We, we tried to do a lot of... Um, uh, writing references to that movie. Yeah, I was going to call them homages. There, the, some of the visual shots too of uh, watching the the moon landing on the televisions outside on the street. I mean, there's, it's beautiful, man. It, it. I was seeing pictures of it as I'm watching your film. I'm just going, oh, this is great, man. Now that takes us to a, another question here. So. The, the movie was shot in 2014, but somehow, uh, you managed to interview, uh, James E. Webb, who died, uh, as the research indicates in 1992, and get an autograph from Stanley Kubrick, who died in 1999. How, how did the film achieve this? You know, it's funny, the first person who's asked me about that James Webb stuff, and, uh, and yeah, that was something we were really proud about it, but everybody just focuses on the Kubrick. I mean, obviously those are done with digital effects, but um, the complexity with which we had to treat them because you're talking about extremely old celluloid that we're then putting digital effects on and trying to combine the two together made it almost impossible. But the, 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 the genius who did it is a guy named Tristan Zarafa, who is our VFX supervisor and who made, um, who made both those sequences happen mostly from photographs. But uh, the James Webb stuff, and when he retires as well, um, it, uh, it 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 was it was news news footage that we got, and then did a ton of manipulation to to get me interacting with those people. The Stanley Kubrick piece it, it was like six months of work, and in fact, there's a whole article in in this month's Movie Maker magazine about exactly how we did it. But um, but that was the most challenging thing on the film by far, from a technical point of view. I mean, that was because, again, Kubrick was was a recluse and he didn't let people film him, especially during making 2001. So we had no footage to do that Forrest Gump trick on. So we had mm -hmm. to make it out of photographs. And that was I mean, Tristan, like, killed himself doing that. But I'm, but I mean, we're all unbelievably proud. I mean, Stanley Kubrick literally is alive and walking and talking in, in our movie. Uh, just so you know, and just for a little context, Ben and I also make a video show where we edit archival footage a lot. And when when those scenes come up, it just hit us really hard, uh, seeing the amount of work that was going on screen. So let's just let's keep on the technological advances in film production, video production. Um, do you, do you ever worry that if you guys can achieve this kind of stuff, uh, do you worry that maybe the CIA or NASA could be working on something similar to Operation Zipper right now? Well, I mean, as I said originally with why I think this, uh, this conspiracy had endured, um, I actually don't think there's enough of a reason for NASA to be lying to the public at any level. Um, and, and I can tell you the reason why, and, and actually I, I learned this while I was at NASA and I'm not sure like, um, what your take is on things like, you know, NASA hiding aliens or NASA hiding technology. 
or any of these types of things. But this explains things in a really interesting way to me that made me go, oh, okay. There's no way NASA is hiding things. And it's this. It's that NASA is unbelievably underfunded. They are, they're, they're literally closing departments like every year, year over year, they're losing money. Um, and, and they're losing jobs. And it's because they have a lot of trouble asking the government who 100% funds them for more money. And in the nineties, I, I don't remember it, but there was some kind of an alien scare or like, you know, in the news, people were saying, Oh, wait, there's some evidence that maybe there's some aliens and NASA wanted to investigate it. And the government gave them something like a hundred million dollars. Like they gave them so much money just to check out this like fraudulent news story or like just this idea that maybe there was alien life. And so the notion that NASA would be intentionally hiding things that they discover is so, is so suicidal. Like they would never ever do that because if, if they found anything, any evidence of anything at all, they would be the first people to go to the New York Times and say, look what we found just because they need money and they'd be so happy to get funding because they discovered something good. Um, but as to your question about like video technology and maybe the CIA using it to like, you know, fake, you know, wars and like the kind of like wag the dog stuff. Um, uh, sure. It seems like these days governments don't need video evidence to, to create, you know, environments with which to go to war. I mean, there was no, you know, smoking gun, like, 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 it's like the weapons of mass destruction during the Iraq war. It's like, I, I don't think that the CIA, need, the CIA needs to manufacture video evidence in the way that, uh, you would have to if you're trying to take the moon landing. I think they have a lot simpler, more rudimentary ways to fool people into doing stupid stuff. Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm with you on that one, Matt, because the, I think one of the troubling things that constructs the, I guess the, the primordial soup from which some of these kind of conspiracies birth is an environment of, uh, rampant distrust and in, in many ways, uh, a well-earned distrust of, uh, some government agencies. But the CIA and NASA are very, very, very different entities, as, uh, most of our listeners know. Um, Hugely. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, one thing that one thing that got us uh, uh our audience and uh Matt uh Matt and our co-host Noel and myself uh all of us are fascinated by learning about the various clandestine or underground operations uh by the CIA and other intelligence agencies and there are numerous CIA operations referenced in the film but Operation Avalanche is not one of yeah. them so what's the significance of the title there uh, well, you know, it's, that bleeds into a, a whole other project that, that I'm making right now, which is a television series. And I mean, for me to explain this, you I mean, you're going to think I'm insane, but <laughs> we, we titled the movie Operation Avalanche one, because I mean, it was basically Matt naming his own mission and thinking that that's a cool name. But uh -huh. more importantly, that plays into a television series that I'm making right now for Vice. Oh yeah, that's uh if if I'm correct, is that Nirvana the band in the show? The band the show? Yes. Yeah, that's correct. And in and in one of the episodes of Nirvana the band the show, which is just a comedy series, um my me and my best friend sneak a movie into Sundance called Operation Avalanche, and it was just very important that the movie be called Operation Avalanche. And again, I know that sounds insane, but uh but that oh, that's man. specifically the reason that it was named exactly exactly that. We're excited to see it and to check it out because we're huge comedy fans as well. Uh, so we've explored some of the we've explored some of the genesis or the origin story for what became Operation Avalanche, and we just found out a, a really cool uh, meta cognitive twist on it. Um, we. We also, in the course of looking into the ideas of moon landings being faked, uh, we also ran into a question that a lot of people have asked. And for me personally, it's up there with the same question, uh, like in order of importance, it's up that it's as important as the question about how thousands of people could keep a secret. And Operation Avalanche answers that so uh, with such grace and elegance. My next question would be something that a lot of our listeners have asked us, which is the following. If, it, if people did indeed land on the moon, then 
Why did they stop going? Why were there only the six missions with two astronauts on the surface each time? Well, I mean, that ties into exactly what I was talking about before when it comes to NASA and their funding. And that's that they were only getting money because there was such a national interest in going on that mission. There was a, like, the all of America was tuned in to see America beat the Russian space program. That's what everybody wanted. But then once it was done, like, nobody cared about the scientific ramifications of that mission. To them, it was just a race. And as soon as we've won, I shouldn't say we because I'm Canadian, but as soon as NASA <laughs> had won, then all of a sudden the public interest vanished. And in fact, I mean, this is a famous story, which I'm sure you've heard before, but like uh, Apollo 12, people were calling into their television providers to complain that the live broadcast of Apollo 12 was interrupting I Love Lucy reruns. <laughs> wow. So like pe- people were so disinterested after they had landed once that just the government saw absolutely no re- like why would you be funding this multi billion dollar program when when the public is i mean it's not getting you elected it's not getting votes it's not drawing eyeballs people just didn't care um and that's why all of a sudden the missions were were, were ceased because one i mean if you talk to nasa scientists they have a very different opinion in fact one of the cool things that i learned when i was at galveston is that because they only did those six missions, they actually didn't learn nearly as much as they wanted to because as one of them told me, the moon is actually very variegated. It's an extremely variegated surface. So they landed in one specific spot, but it's not uniform at all. They wanted to go all around the moon and find all, like there's tons of stuff up there that they just don't know what it is, um, but they had to stop. Now, what the scientific applications of having a perfect geo map of the moon would be, I don't know. Um, but but they had to stop because public interest died. It had nothing to do with, you know, like some conspiracy or like, oh, yeah, we can't keep this lie up anymore. No way. It was it was completely because the public had zero interest. And I'm telling you, you're going to see this again um, in the next, I mean, 20 years as we start to look at Mars and other planets. As soon as the national interest tilts towards uh, what's that? Terraforming other planets or or or, or, or uh, interplanetary travel? You will see a resurgence of funding and these missions, and it's it's always about public eyeballs. What what does the voter want to have happen? It's very rarely led by science. Well, you know, now we're seeing private interest in going back to the moon uh, because of the of the helium three content on the moon and trying to be able to mine that and other minerals. Oh. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I'd be interested to see how that kind of changes in the next 10, 20 years. Mm-hmm. It's quite possible that the future of uh, the future of our galactic exploration will be driven by commercial interests, similar to the way that, you know, the Dutch East India Company partnered up with its government at the time to create a super powerful corporate interest and. Is it going to be good? Is it going yeah. to be evil? Will it be United Fruit? Right. Will we will we be alive to find out? How quick will the timeline go? I, you know, I'm sorry. I'm I'm uh at this point I'm just expounding on this cuz I I believe wholeheartedly that um the compelling interest for space exploration for any sustained exploration is going to have to be commercial at this point. Yeah, we've lost we've lost that love, man, for exploration mm-hmm. as a public. So uh, jumping back into operations that occur within this film, there there are two points in the movie where Operation Northwoods is mentioned, and a lot of people who who went, who end up watching your movie may miss some of the context with this or some of the meta stuff you're playing with there. Um, but explain to us. Uh, what the context of Operation Northwoods is in the film? Oh, sure. Uh, Northwoods is a is a CIA uh, uh, mission that went on, uh, I think, from '59 uh, forward, um, and it was just recently declassified. I think within the last five years, maybe the last seven years, it was declassified. Um, and it was just another one of those crazy, like you cannot believe it's happening, CIA missions from the 1960s, which was specifically that they were going to fake 
they didn't call them terrorist attacks, but they were going to fake terrorist attacks as though they were done by the Cubans. And they were going to use this to drum up support for an invasion of Cuba. And Northwoods was a huge blanket operation that, um, and I mean, I'm not like a scholar on this stuff. This is basically just what I learned from the research for this movie I was making. But uh, within Operation Northwoods were a whole bunch of other minor operations. And one of the ones that we reference in our movie uh, was either Operation Dirty Trick or maybe Operation Drop Kick. I don't know which one it was, but it was crazy. And it, the idea was with, mis- with missiles based out of Cuba, they were going to shoot down John Glenn's rocket if something technically went wrong. So if, I mean, God knows how, how serious they were, but I mean, it's all in the mission. So mm-hmm. if that first, you know, circle, first man in space rocket from NASA went up and had any kind of technical malfunction, the CIA was going to intentionally shoot it down with missiles coming out of Russia, sorry, out of Cuba and blame it on the Soviets, which is just like insane, but, uh, but really sets the stage well for a, um, for why they would want to fake the moon landing. It, it helps our movie quite a bit. Okay, now I don't, oh man, I feel like we're giving away spoilers like crazy for this. Mm-hmm. But we'll, um, we'll, we'll, we'll tell people about the spoilers in yeah, the beginning. Basically see the movie, then listen to this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but okay, there's a an action that you that you your character Matt Johnson, the guy, the agent, uh, takes after cutting together all of the documentary footage that you guys have shot uh, throughout the course of the movie, both of them, um, where you bury a reel, and I think if I'm remembering correctly, it, there are a couple different reels that you bury, but one of them, uh, one of them is the movie itself, and. It just makes me think, do you, <laughs> do you think somewhere out there there's a reel of film buried that has, I don't know, another shot from the grassy knoll or <laughs> maybe the actual moon landing set? <laughs> I mean, I would love to think that. I mean, I think the fact is that type of self-reflexive making documentaries about yourself and filming what you're doing was not in the zeitgeist during that time in such a way where somebody would think, oh, this is important. I don't think people, like, let's say that there's a conspiracy to kill JFK and the people who were involved in that thought it was important enough that they would document it. I, that just seems like such a stretch. Um, that they might uh, so I wish themselves. there was. That'd be amazing. I mean, there's, yeah, there's such a, such an awesome, like, cachet to, oh, I just found this. I think there's a there's a movie. What's the movie with Nicolas Cage where oh. he finds the photographs at the very end? Yeah, it's either the, the action movie, but it's the, the Rock or like, Con Air. Hey. No, it must be the Rock. It must be the Rock yeah. because he's dealing with that MI6 agent. Yeah. Um. So like that that that's so pulpy and so exciting that uh, I hope it's true. But it, uh, I think uh, Occam's Razor says uh, there's 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 no way. It'd be it'd be too crazy. It would be it would be too crazy uh, to essentially incriminate oneself in that regard, right? Unless you had a very good reason, which which Matt has in in, in Operation Avalanche, like he's doing it basically as a safety net. It's almost an insurance policy. I, I, I can't imagine somebody doing that from the inside without really, really, really having a reason to do it. Um. Also, I mean, I can tell you from experience that burying film canisters like that that celluloid would not last like not a good idea <laughs> it'd be, it would be completely stripped it'd be it would be stripped because in, in order to damage a lot of the, the the frames of operation avalanche like our movie we did bury them and we wouldn't leave things buried for more than 16 hours before before the acetone was completely eroded so oh wow the- we're getting uh we're getting some inside yeah. looks uh, in here. Uh we do want our listeners to know that you can check this movie out for yourself today, the day this podcast comes out. That's right. Operation Avalanche is in a theater near you uh starting September 16th, 2016. Uh and Matt, we want to thank you so much for your time today and this is uh this is an astonishing look at a I guess it's almost a, um, 
it's a terrifyingly possible explanation for a moon landing hoax. That is ultimately seemingly impossible. It's just you guys were way too successful with convincing me, at least personally. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and uh, we think we... We, uh, we want to commend you on a job well done and we hope that everybody checks out this film. Uh, before we, before we end, uh, today's episode, uh, we wanted to give the last word to you. Is there, is there anything that you would like to add about Operation Avalanche or say directly to people, uh, who are also fascinated by the idea that the moon landing was faked? Yeah. And I, I think what, what I'd like to say is that I don't believe the moon landing was faked, but it's very clear that like an environment of lies existed in the United States during the 1960s, which they used to manipulate the public at large. And just because the moon landing like wasn't faked by the CIA doesn't mean that there weren't dozens and dozens and dozens of instances in which institutions like the CIA heavily manipulated the truth to change the, the the policies of the United States to put their citizens. So, um, so, I mean, uh, hopefully people are getting that from this movie without necessarily needing to believe in the conspiracy. Um, but, uh, but we're, we're happy with it either way. Uh, at some level, it's just sort of a cool story. Matt, thank you again so much. And listeners, do check out, uh, do check out the upcoming Operation Avalanche at a theater near you September 16th, the day this comes out. So if you're listening to this the day it comes out, then, uh, hopefully you're already on your way to the theater. Yeah, drive in there now. So pretty interesting stuff. What do you think? I loved that interview. I could talk to Matt Johnson for a long time because he was very open about not believing himself personally in the moon landing conspiracy, but he was also able to construct a film that convinced me of something that I've never been convinced of, which is that you wouldn't need, you know, thousands and thousands of people in on the conspiracy. You would just need a select few. Well, it's also something that we try to do where we try to look at both sides of an issue and be respectful to those that, you know, might believe differently than we ourselves do from time to time. Certainly. Absolutely. So also I, I still don't think we have maybe the, the best answer to why the moon landings or moon lunar missions stopped. Uh, the idea that it would be a funding issue seems pretty compelling and I enjoyed uh, Matt Johnson's uh, prediction that the same thing will occur with manned Mars missions. Yeah, as soon as the zeitgeist kind of leaves and moves on to something else, mm-hmm. then it'll be difficult to get taxpayers to say, yeah, let's give a good portion of our taxes to this. Mm-hmm. And we want to know uh, what you think, listeners, given some of the stuff we outlined here. Uh, do you believe, to paraphrase R.E.M., do you believe they put a man on the moon? Or do you believe that this is all some elaborate wag the dog hoax? And if so, why? We've all checked out room 237 in this room, Nola, Matt and I, and we've all delved into the Stanley Kubrick side, the theory Mm -hmm. of it. So we would like to hear from you. And if you think that the moon landing did occur, but occurred perhaps under different circumstances, maybe some other group got there first, or maybe moon landings continued in secret, we'd love to hear more details about those theories. Kubrick burned his set. I mean, come on, guys. He burned his set. I know it's like, hey, you can't, nobody else will be able to use this stuff. It will only live in the celluloid now, my film, these sets. But still, I don't know, guys. And you can also check out some of our earlier uh, video episodes on lunar conspiracies. Uh as well as a video we'll have coming out uh, that addresses the the one-on-one, the introduction to the belief that the moon landing was hoaxed. Yeah, it really focuses on the Apollo 11 mission itself. And guys, you know where you can find us. If you want to go dig deep, dive down that rabbit hole into our back catalog, you can find every podcast we've ever recorded at StuffTheyDon'tWantYouToKnow.com 
or if you are more into uh, you know using a Spotify or a Stitcher or an iTunes maybe go do that but do us a solid if there's a way leave us some kind words it helps people discover the show and helps the algorithm uh, push us out to more potential listeners and also you know makes us a little less likely to get fired Absolutely. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook where we conspiracy stuff. You can check out our Instagram where we are conspiracy stuff show. And that's the end of this classic episode. If you have any thoughts or questions about this episode, you can get into contact with us in a number of different ways. One of the best is to give us a call. Our number is 1-833-STDWYTK. If you don't want to do that, you can send us a good old fashioned email. We are conspiracy at iheartradio.com stuff they don't want you to know is a production of iHeartRadio. for more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app apple podcasts or wherever you listen to your favorite shows